Next speaker is Pablo Sanchez Bosch, talking about tracking morphogens down and covering the DPP morphogen gradient. So thank you all for coming, and I also wanted to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my job here. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to show my latest results in, in this project in which I want to understand how the morphogenetic gradient of DPP is established in the wing disk. So DPP as a morphogen controls growth and patterning to tightly regulated uh, processes during development. And I'm studying it in the wing disk, and this is how the morphogen works there. So basically, DPP is produced at the, at the anterior posterior boundary, shown here in this picture, and it starts to be produced when engrailed is expressed in the posterior compartment, driving the expression of hedgehog, and then hedgehog will diffuse and will reach some cells that engrailed doesn't. These cells are the ones that are going to produce DPP, that at some point will be secreted, and it will produce the long range gradient that we have seen or we have heard before. So if we see it in detail, uh, we have some cells of the wing imaginal disk here. And then once the PP is secreted in the extracellular space, it will move around. And at some point, it will reach the receptors, and it will activate the, the downstream targets and the signaling pathway. Uh, this um, produces what was described by Louis Volper as the French flag model in which different thresholds of the morphogen will produce different groups of cells that will determine, in the end, the, the adult structures of the wing. The cells that are farther away will express Brinker, which is the, re the negative regulator of the pathway, and the ones that are closer are going to express different sets of genes that will, in the end, produce the adult structures. So, so far, it's easy to understand, but it's important to know that such a tightly regulated process needs also a tightly regulated um, gradient. And there are many models to try to explain how this gradient is established in the, in the marginal disk. And the first one I want uh, to just show is uh, the expansion repression uh, by Benicillo, but it's mm, the, the system that it's working in the embryo. But the proofs in the wing disk are not that, that strong. The second model that has been proposed by Kornberg is the one that describes the, the cytonyms, these long protrusions that come from the sides of the wing disk, and then they reach the, the, the morphogen, and they have the receptors in the, in the cytonym, so they can start transducing the signal. And then the last two models are the, the first one that were proposed and are the most easy to understand because the, one of them is the free extracellular diffusion, so basically the morphogen is secreted, and it moves freely until it reaches the receptor, or the hinder diffusion. And if we consider that the wing disk is a very tight, tightly packed sets of cells, uh, it's uh, easy to understand that all these glipicans that are in, in the outside of the cells, all the receptors, they are going to hinder the diffusion of DPP. And many measurements have shown that DPP is diffusing at a very slow speed to be considered free diffusion. So why there are so many models to try to explain this and, and why there is no uh, concerns in that? And probably the, <clears throat> the main problem comes because um, so far DPP has been studied with the gal 4 us system, which is very good to, to understand a gene function. But in such a process in which very small levels of the morphogen can make a difference, producing the overexpression with the gal 4 us system is going to create some problems. And as you can see in this picture from, from the paper from Gonfalet Gaitan, the expression of the US GFP DPP produces overexpression of the wing disk. And even if you have a complete knockout of DPP in the wing, in, in the wing disk and you produce only the, the GFP DPP, the wing is not normal. It has some, some mm, not normal uh, structure, some malformation in the, in the veins showing that this system is good for some things but not for others. For that, we wanted to develop a system in which we can image the grade information and find out which components are uh, involved in the production of this gradient and also try to establish a model that could be explained with the with endogenous uh, produced DPP. Uh, what we have done is by CRISPR-Cas9, we have produced a knockout of the endogenous DPP and we have replaced it with a tandem, two copies of DPP with different tags that we can image because they have some, they have different tags. And, and the key of this 
of this transgene that we have generated is that these two copies in tandem, the first one surrounded by FRTs, allows us to delete the first copy at any time point and then see how the protein is disappearing after the genes have been cleaved out by the flip recombinase. And then the second copy will start to be produced only when the first one is deleted. So we can also see how the second copy appears and produces the long range gradient. With this model, the first thing we had to do, of course, is test that it works. And as you can see in the pictures, in the control where the, when the flip recombinase is not active, only the first copy of the, of the tandem is produced. And whenever we activate the flip recombinase, in this case with a heat, pro, uh, heat shock promoter, then the first copy disappears and only the second one is produced. And knowing that the system works, then the next step is to measure the, the gradient and the different parameters that compose this gradient. In, in this point, it's important to know that there are two different populations of DPP in the wing disc. The first one is the intracellular, in the producing cells and in the ones that are degrading the protein, and the second one is the extracellular. The intracellular population, especially the one in the secreting cells, is so intense and so strong that whenever I do an intracellular staining, I will never see the extracellular protein. So I have to do two different stainings to study the populations of DPP. The intracellular to see when the protein is produced or is stopped to be produced, and the extracellular to see how the gradient is, how the shape, and how much protein I have in the, in the tissue. So the idea is that uh, with, this, uh, with this tandem system, I combine it with the gulf 4 us to activate the flip, and I use the driver, the Apterus driver, to express the flip only in the dorsal compartment of the, of the marginal disc. In this way, I can use the ventral compartment as a control in which the first protein will always be produced and never the second one. And I use the dorsal compartment as the system to see how the, how the protein is secreted and how the gradient is created. The idea was to analyze how long this gradient takes to, to be formed and how uh, quick is the process. And then from all these time points, I found out that with only the last 24 hours, I can study the whole process because the first protein is completely uh, replaced by the second. With the two different stainings, with extracellular, I will see when the first copy is completely degraded and when the second one is uh, reaching the steady state gradient, so the, the final gradient. And with the intracellular staining, I can see when the second protein is produced and the first one is not produced anymore. First, about the intracellular gradient, I did the analysis over these 24 hours and if we go into the details of the wing disc, here is at time zero and, and three hours, you can see that some of the protein is already cleaved out because there is some ectopic activation, but it's, it's all, and this is always happening in the hinge region, and I'm studying the pouch here. And in the pouch, only the first protein is produced. Whenever we advance in time, this is six and nine hours, still nothing is happening in the pouch. This is the time that the flip recombinant takes to be activated and then cleave the first copy. And then at 12 hours, we start to see the shift. At 15 hours, we almost don't find the first uh, copy anymore and only the second one. And once we go to 18 hours, we already only find the second copy and not the first one. This is the time in which the first one is not produced anymore. And that's the most interesting time to analyze. If we put it in a plot, what we do is uh, just uh, the, the thresholding of the, of the intensity so we can see the area of the, of the cells that are producing the first or the second copy, or both of them. And then in the plot, it looks like this. You can see how fast, when one protein is stopped to be produced, the second one is already replacing it. And there is a very, very low time in which both proteins coexist here. That it's the, the time in which the RNA of the, of the first copy is still present in the cells, and there are still some proteins that are not secreted. But most of the, of the process, when one protein disappears, the other one appears. And as I say, at 18 hours, the presence of the, of the, second pro, of the first protein is, uh, is completely negligible because it's uh, below the 10% of the, of the total area. This is very good for the intracellular, but if I want to measure the extracellular, I will need more, more data because it's not uh, black or white, it's a gradient. And then I wanted to show with intracellular first that uh, I can, instead of doing the, the thresholding and see the area, I can just plot the intensity of the, of the DPP um, protein. And I had to check that if I plot many disks at the same time, this, uh, this system is reliable because I cannot analyze only one disk. I need a high number to, to see the whole thing. 
And in this picture, you can see that when I plot many disks to, uh, together, they all fit in the average. And, and then they, they have a very small variation between the different disks. If I plot the different time points, then it looks like this. You can see us in the graph before, but with much more detail, how the first protein, the green one, disappears slowly from 0 to 18 hours, and how the second one completely replaces the first one at 18 hours, as I showed before with the graph. Now going to the extracellular staining. In green, I still show the intracellular as a reference. And in red, you can see the extracellular and how it reaches a much farther region than the intracellular here. And then whenever I plot it together with the intracellular, you can see that, uh, as we expected, the gradient is much broader. But also, we see that there is a bit more noise because the protein outside of the cell, the levels are so low that even the background um, is detected here, and it's also hindering a bit the, the intensity. So I require the analysis of much more disk to, to do that. And as an example of what's happening here, so you can see that at 12 hours, when the first protein is already deleted some, from some parts, the extracellular staining still looks exactly the same as the, as the ventral domain. So the protein is still there. And at 18 hours, when the protein wasn't present anymore, I can still detect some of the extracellular here. And I have to go to 24 hours to completely lose the, the presence of the, of the first copy. If we plot it here in a graph, the average intensity of, uh, of many mesor disks, disks, we can see that it's gradually degrading and disappearing. But still, as I said, at 18 hours, still 20% of the protein is present in the extracellular um, region when the intracellular is already gone. As a summary of uh, what I have saw, we have a very versatile and efficient method to measure the morphogen in which these two proteins can be analyzed at the same time. And we have seen how fast the DPP secretion is and how low time these two copies of the protein coexist inside the cell. And then the intracellular disappears, as I said, at 18 hours. It's negligible because the, um, the levels of protein are very low. But the extracellular is still there. And it's present until 21, 22 hours. With this, the ongoing work and our working hypothesis right now is that DPP is secreted. And most of the protein is retained either by the, by the glipicans, DALI and DALI-like, or, or by the receptor. And this pool of extracellular DPP lasts a long time outside of the cells, which is inconsistent with a free diffusion model in which the degradation of the protein has to be really fast to keep this long range gradient with a free diffusion. And then, of course, we still have to analyze more time points. So we can, we can plot the graph and then get the effective degradation coefficient, which is necessary in the end to do a, to do a model of the diffusion. And just to show in the end, I wanted to show these last pictures I took, in which when we delete the glipicans, in this case it's Dalit, we use RNAi to knock down Dalit, we see an effect that it's very similar that if we knock down also the, the receptor thick veins. And this shows us that the glipicans are really involved in the, in the gradient formation. And whenever they are not present, the disk is not only increasing the, the expression of Brinker, the inhibitor, which will only be expressed in this region from here, but it's enhanced very close to the DPP gradient. But also, you can see that the compartment, the dorsal compartment, is smaller than the ventral. So the gradient of DPP is not formed properly if the glipicans are not there to retain the, the extracellular protein for the time it's required for the growth. With that, I wanted to, to thank all the people that made this, uh, this project possible, especially Connie for allowing me to do the PhD, and also the committee for all the input I had, and all the people that was involved at some point in, in the project, and of course, you for your attention. Do you get a full... Do you get a full rescue with your, with your, with your new system? Is it, uh, are the veins are perfect? Uh, yes, I, I didn't have time to show all the, all the controls, but yes, uh, we also check the adult wings and everything and the system rescues. So we can do homozygous uh, transients. Uh, last question. I was wondering if you thought that, uh, whether you'd find that one of your models was correct, or do you think it's likely a combination of several of those different models that's actually involved in how DPP signaling works? 
Yeah, I actually think that might be the case, and that's the reason there are some models, because some of them contradict each other. Maybe you think the free diffusion cannot be together with the, with the hinder diffusion, or the side tunings are not compatible with the other, but I think it's a kind of a combination of two or three of the, of the models, or some of the proteins interact with each other. It's a complicated uh, thing what's happening there with the, with the gradient, and it's very tightly regulated. So yeah, I think it's a combination. So thank you, Pablo.